Hello everyone, my name is Connor, I'm part of the Artists and Venues team as well as the ticketing team and today I have the pleasure of hosting this panel, Turning Producing into a Year-Round Career. Uh, I'd like to start today by acknowledging that the land we meet on today is the land of the Ghana people and pay my respect to all elders past, present and emerging. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We'll start today by um, introducing the panel of producers we have. Uh, starting with Daisy Mann. Daisy is the producer of Brown Women Comedy and the founder of Australian South Asian Centre. After noticing the lack of diversity in the comedy scene in Australia, Daisy piloted Brown Women Comedy in 2022, and it has grown to be the largest lineup of Indian and South Asian women comedians in Australia, having sold out two years in a row at Melbourne International Comedy Festival. Prior to producing comedy, she has managed University of Melbourne's entrepreneurship program, Melbourne Accelerator program, and established Deakin University's flagship entrepreneurship program, Spark Deakin. Daisy lives in Melbourne and is proudly Punjabi Australian. We also have Britt Plummer. Britt is an Adelaide-based actor, theatre maker, teacher, and director of Frank Theatre. She studied two years with Master of Clown, Philippe Gaulier, at his school in France. This year, Frank is presenting Fool's Paradise at the Courtyard of Curiosities at the Migration Museum, a venue which Brit manages with Nick Phillips. Previously, Frank's shows include Chameleon by Brit Plummer, which won the Adelaide Fringe Emerging Artists Award and was part of the Rumpus Theatre season in 2020, directed by Hugh Parnham. And The Baroque, physical comedy starring Oliver Nielsen and directed by Brit Plummer, which won her the Best Emerging Producer Award in 2021. And finally, we have Joanne Hartstone. Joanne is a multi-award winning theatre maker, performer, playwright, producer and presenter, specialising in international collaborations, live theatre and cabaret and immersive site-specific events. Joanne has built and curated pop-up venues in the Adelaide Botanic Gardens, which was Black Box Theatres, and the Queen's Theatre, and presented multiple seasons as a performer and producer in Edinburgh, Hollywood, London, New York and Sydney. Joanne has been presenting work in Adelaide Fringe since 2007 and is now a prolific figure in the entertainment industry, who has recently broadened her repertoire into digital events. She won the inaugural Made in Adelaide Award in 2017, the Frank Ford Award in 2020, multiple Best Theatre and Critics Circle Awards, and two Innovation Awards in 2021 for her digital theatre work during COVID. Joanne is also a teacher and mentor to emerging artists. Please join me in welcoming our panel. So thank you all for joining me today. Um, we might start by going down the line and tell me a little bit about how you came to the role of a producer. Sure. Um, well, thank, thank you for introducing us. I thought you were going to read a little bit of it, but you read the whole thing, so hopefully, hopefully you're still with us. Uh, no, I started Brown Women Comedy three years ago. I actually didn't even know that I was a producer. I was applying for a grant once, and I put myself down as an event coordinator because <laughs> I'm not from this industry at all. I worked in higher education in universities, um, and so I remember applying for this one grant, and this the, the, I spoke to the people who managed the grant. She's like, oh, no, no, that's an artistic expense. You're a producer. I was like, oh, okay. So I'm really, really, I was really fresh to this in 2022 when I first started. But yeah, it was just, I run a non-profit called Australian South Asian Centre and we do programs and events that amplify South Asian women. So South Asian is Indian, Pakistani, Sri Lankan, Nepalese, it's that region. Um, and I, obviously I belong to, to, to I'm from, I'm Punjabi, so that's also in that region. And I just noticed a complete lack of South Asian women in this space. Uh, so we do a range of different programs and comedy was one we just, we met sort of four women, uh, four women comedians who were South Asian and I thought, why don't we put them together and put a show on? I didn't know I was about to start producing. I was just going to organise it. So I called a venue, I was like, hey, can you give us a discount? Cool, can you give us a discount? Can we get another discount? <laughs> and we put it on and we thought 30 people would show up. We ended up having to add another one at about 180. 60 people showed up over the two shows as part of, and we're part of Melbourne International Comedy Festival. And then I, I, I did some research. I was like, wow, this really stuck. Um, and it turns out in like Melbourne Comedy Festival, out of 550 shows, there's only two other South Asian women. <laughs> so there's an audience and there's about 200,000 South Asians in Victoria alone, I think. So there is an audience that was just completely untapped for us. And that's, yeah, our audience. And that's how I got into it. So somewhat accidentally and frustrated with the lack of diversity. Yeah, nice. How about for you, Britt? 
Yeah, well, I'd just come back from studying overseas. Like, first I studied as an actor here, like, t a long time ago. <laughs> and then um, I went and specialised in um, physical comedy and clowning, and that all came out of the fringe circuit because I was seeing all these amazing performers that were writing their own work, um, devised works. They had this really, like, gorgeous connection with the audience. Um, and there was the, a common thread between them all that they all studied with Philippe Goulier. It was like artists like Trick V, Wake and Shaw, um, we had the, the Fringe Wives Club, Tessa Waters. Uh, so I just went, okay, I'll go do that. <laughs> um, and then when I got back, I had an idea for a show and that was Chameleon and it was a solo show. And I... Well, you know, when you start registering, all of a sudden you're a, you're a producer. If you're an independent artist and you don't have a producer, you are a producer. Um, and so that's kind of how it started. I, there was a little bit of clowning happening here already um, outside of the fringe circuit. Um, Hugh Parham, um, who I know you know Connor, um, he's a local performer, was doing a lot of that kind of work. Um, but I thought, well, I'm going to start my own company. It's just me at the moment. I'm going to call it Frank. And I, um, I want to explore the human condition, social issues with humour and heart. And so that's where it started. I just made a website. Um, I think it was an Instagram page first. It's always um, an Instagram page. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, even with the venue, we've got an Instagram page. Maybe we'll have a website next year. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it started. And then I just picked up a lot along the way. And um, I started having other artists ask me questions. Oh, how did you do that? How did you do that cool story on... Oh, have you ever heard of Canva? Um, <laughs> you know? So, um, and also I think um, the nature of being an independent artist, you start applying for grants. Like, it's the only, really, it's the only way to make work. So you kind of used to writing about yourself and um, so yeah I was getting questions from lots of people and then um, after that I started producing other people's work because they said oh actually are you doing anything this year do you want to do that for me um, so that yeah that's kind of how it started yeah gorgeous and Joanne how about yourself I think it's the same answer by accident <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know I think uh, I, I started as a as an actor training at Flinders University Drama Centre uh, and then in our final year, we were doing a show called Hamlet and we had a visiting director, John Green, come and direct Hamlet for us. And he actually said to another professor of mine, Michael Morley, that um, I'd be, I'm a good actor, but she'd be a very good production manager. I think because I was telling people what to do. <laughs> so, um, so I think then as I uh, went through, um, you know, graduated, went, okay, what next? Uh, I wanted to put on a show, so my, um, I put on a couple of shows in the Adelaide Fringe, two at once, of course, because that's what you do. Uh, and the back of house needed to be done, so the, the logistics behind it. And that's sort of how I fell into producing as well as creating. Um, and I think that as a producer, you have to be able to do all of the bits. You know, you have to do the marketing and publicity. You have to do all the grant applications. You have to do... Uh, you have to have a really good understanding of how the show works and why it works and where it works and, and who the show is for and all those... You have to be across everything. So as little me <laughs> wanting to be in everything and be able to help with everything, I think I fell into it kind of accidentally and then realised it was really important to keep doing that, not just for myself and my own work, but actually for our entire industry to keep doing. Absolutely. And when you were starting as emerging producers, what would you say was the perhaps the biggest challenge you faced in those first early years and how did you overcome it? Money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Funding, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, just applying for everything um, and getting um, colleagues to read over your grant applications. Like, plenty of people will do that, actually. Like, early on, you're, when you're starting out, it's like... It, it's, it's often very hard to talk about yourself in a way that, like, really s sells it and you get really good at it. <laughs> um, but initially, it's like, oh, can I say that? Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> so, um, yeah, 
for me, that it was definitely just reaching out to people and going, God, oh, what do you think? Oh, I'd cut that paragraph. I'd do that. I think you're saying that twice. Um, and then just going for everything, looking, um, looking up at all the grants that are coming up in the next six months and, and actually planning. Um, because if you put all your eggs in one basket, oh, they, you know, the Adelaide Fringe has got a great one um, in during August or September. It's about five thousand um, dollars. You know, that's that's a great one that you know when you're in the kind of registration period, you know, to go for. But um, there's plenty of others. Uh, yeah. I think, I think for me it was understanding how long something is meant to take and how much time I'm meant to allocate to that thing. Because as a producer, like you're saying, you do a lot of – Joanne, you are saying you do a lot of everything. But how much should each task take? So I, I was obsessed with sales. <laughs> I think me coming from the entrepreneurial world, like I think – being a producer, you bring ideas to life. And if you do that in the business world, you're an entrepreneur. That's what you, you're a founder. But in the arts world, you're called a producer. But especially, like, you're, you're dealing with the budget. You're dealing with bringing in money. You're dealing with selling. Um, and especially if you're, you know, also, like, I'm also an artist. I perform in our show. So you do a lot. I think for me, the hardest part was looking at, all right, how much time should I allocate to each of these things? Like, just filling out the Melbourne International Comedy form felt like filling in a visa application. <laughs> it was like 10, 10 pages and you need $20 million insurance. I'm like, how badly could we mess this up? Like, what could we do that we need $20 million cover? <laughs> but there's just so, so many, like, little things like that. Um, and then you're designing things on Canva. You spend a lot of time because if you don't want to outsource it, I spend so many hours on Canva. I think I work there. But I'm hoping next year I will will hire someone <laughs> in our fourth year. Yeah. I think there was uh, something else other than money for me was also my sense of legitimacy. And I was very young when I started. I'm trying to do some maths. I think I was about 21 um, when I started. And... I was quickly in the same room as very experienced producers doing, you know, APAMs and those sorts of things. And I was, I was <laughs> despite appearances, very nervous um, and um, I didn't know how to network. Um, I thought, I, I don't want to do a hard sell, I just sort of, you know, would hide, but then I also wouldn't see myself represented in the rooms that I was in. It was, you know, 20 years ago was... Uh, 18 years ago, was a lot of um, older men in the room and here I was a 21-year-old, fresh-faced, eager uh, woman trying to sort of be at the same level. Of course, I had so much to learn, of course. So then I think it was a self-belief and a belief in the work and understanding that I was just a representative of the work and the work was the hero. So that was a bit of a mind shift for me as well, saying that I'm important, but I'm also not as important as a lot of this other stuff. So I let that be the hero, and that was a big part of my um, bringing up into the producing world, I guess. Yeah, gorgeous. I, I want to interrogate that a little bit more. Um, you were recently quoted saying, if I do my job well, then I should be really invisible. Yeah. Would, would you mind elaborating on yeah, that a little bit? Yeah, and I've actually had a little bit of feedback about this. Not necessarily criticism, because... Um, part of what I do, so I just want to open up to everybody here. I feel like I've got my back to you. Hello. Um, part of what I do is also curate, and that means that people need to trust me, me, Joanne Hartstone, you know, and saying if this is a good show, you need to, I want to tell you about this show, so therefore I can't really be invisible. But actually, as a producer, a lot of the things that we do are behind the scenes and just appear to be like magic, you know. Suddenly the show is existing and it's got all the props and it's got all the marketing and it's got all the public liability insurance and it's got all of these <laughs> things. And so if I've done all of that really well, the audience shouldn't be thinking about any of that. I should be an invisible entity who's just waved my magic wand and made these things happen. So actually in some ways that can feel a little bit isolating. Um, but... I also think that if you're going, oh my gosh, this is so dangerous, this venue is not the right fit, those costumes are, you know, <laughs> about to fall off or, you know, um, I didn't even hear about the show, then I'm more visible because I haven't done the right job. Does that make sense? So, yeah, if you do the job, everything just appears to happen in the most amazing place. And me as the producer, not me as the curator, but me as the producer just fades into the background and the art is the hero. Yeah, great, great. Um, you all mentioned before that finances are a 
major hurdle um, when creating your own art and when producing as well. Um, you've touched on grants as one form of income. Are there any other ways that you'd, um, you've found streams of income? Mm, we got like sponsors last time. So just going out to corporates or companies saying, hey, buy 10 tickets um, or for 20 tickets. So we pitched and that was, you know, got us a few sort of sponsors. And then we created a category last year called VIP tickets to meet our artists and whatnot. And our artists are emerging, but it was a way to really pitch to sponsors and be like, you get to meet the artist, you get to sit up the front, whatnot. But then that, that helped us fill up some seats to like double the price. And that was helpful. Um, it, it was hard. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. And it was really the sponsors that came through were ones we had connections to somehow. We once worked there. Someone else worked there. It wasn't anyone I reached out to that I didn't know was, was definitely hard to get over the line. Yeah. How about yourself, Britt? Crowdfunding. Um, I haven't used it for a show yet, but I have used it for um, study purposes. Um, I know that uh, the Australian Cultural Fund through Creative Partnerships have got this matched funding. Um, I think there's a couple of rounds a year for that. And so, um, you know, whatever your target is, it's, you know, five grand, ten grand, they double it. So you get that amount of money again. Um, so that is definitely something I'm looking to for the next show. Uh, but lots, yeah, lots of artists do that. And, um, yeah, it's a great way um, for people to support the show. You, you know, you can offer, um, like, you know, a free ticket on opening night or that kind of thing if you do a certain donation. But, um some of the older ones that were around like possible you had to give all these things and um i think a lot of people were getting quite exhausted with all the prizes they had to give out for the amount of um money that was given um but yeah australian cultural fund it's just donate su support yeah yeah i've used it myself it's great yeah uh, joanne how about you um so i i I don't like grants. I don't think anyone really enjoys no. writing grant applications. And I feel that you can spend a lot of your time creating these projects on paper for them not to go anywhere. And I think that's really frustrating. And I think that there's something in the industry that needs to change about that. Um, and I want to also reassure you, people recognise this. You know, I've been in a lot of rooms at um, particularly this festival where people have recognised that this is really, it's unpaid work and it's risky work that you're putting everything on paper. Now, there is a flip side to that to say, you should know all of the stuff that you're putting on paper, but time is valuable. And, you know, all of our time is valuable. Your time is valuable. So um, I just wanted to start by saying that's annoying. <laughs> Grants are annoying. The other thing I'd really like to encourage people to do is putting money into, I call it bounce money. Um, it's, it started from when I was like 12 years old and my grandfather unfortunately died uh, and he left all of his grandchildren like $1,000 or something, you know. But I kept that in the bank as my bounce money that I could tap into at 12 years old. Who am I? <laughs> What's going on? Um, so that if there was something I really needed, I'd always have $1,000 in the bank and then I tried to top that up as soon as and then I wouldn't touch it. So sometimes I went under the $1,000, but then it was part of my savings to kind of get that back. And I think as a producer, we all actually need to remember that we need bounce money. Those costumes need to be bought before the ticket sales come in. So you need to have that bounce money. So I would say for every project, every gig you do, everything, taking 5%, 10%, whatever you can look at in your budgets and putting it into an account that you don't touch, which is so that you c aren't entirely reliant on grants to get started mm. at the beginning. And I really think that's important for emerging artists and producers. I think it's important for us to remember as well so that I have a separate you know, grants fund, or I call it the grants fund, but actually I feed into it as well. And knowing your value with things. So <coughs> going into money, I wonder how many artists actually know how much money they need to survive. You know, have you, you I'm sure you've done show budgets. Have you done a life budget? Um, do you know, sure, a lot of people know what their mortgage or their rent is, but do you know how much actually per week you need to survive? And then going, okay, well then if I was going to be paid for a job, that's how much I should charge as a base plus 30%. Right? And then you know that that 30% is your flexibility, but then you have a, a no-go kind of below, below so that you can live. Because if you can't live, you can't do your job, 
the work doesn't happen. And I think that's really important for us to encourage each other with, to say we need to be able to survive however that happens. Some people get benefits, some people have side jobs or main jobs and this is a side job. That's been my case. I've been a teacher as well and that's been my main source of income for the last 15 years um, because it actually pays. And then I take time off to do this stuff which doesn't pay me enough to last for the entire year. That's now changing because I've invested in myself and my bounce money is there. So uh, that's a little bit of a, <laughs> a spin. That's great. But I think when we talk about money, we need to, to value ourselves and value time and, this, and acknowledge that the system is broken when it comes to grants but they're also a necessary evil. So definitely yeah. don't bite the hand that feeds. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adelaide Fringe. Thank you very much, Art South Australia. City, City of Adelaide for funding our show, yeah. being here. We really appreciate it. Couldn't do it without you. Can, can I add something Absolutely, to, to yeah. grants? Um, there are many positives to them. Obviously, you know, when you get them, um, that's Yay. the best. <laughs> Uh, but I actually really enjoy writing them. Maybe I'm one of the wow. only people. Um, <laughs> I have met a few people <laughs> like you, but I am not one. <laughs> because for me, it's a little bit of a love letter to the work. And for, like, it reiterates for yourself, like, why are you actually creating this work? Like, I've actually started writing grant applications and I'm like, oh no, I shouldn't do this project. You know, like, um, what is it, what are the audience outcomes for it? What's the community outcomes? Um, uh, I've lost my train of thought. Um, You're absolutely right though, because it does, it should be your first line of um, assessment. Self-assessment in the work that you're putting forward. Yeah. I completely agree with you. Like, who's who's your target audience? Yeah. That's, like, one of the big ones that comes up. And, like, if you don't know that, then when you come around to marketing your show at Fringe Time, you're just kind of throwing, like, yeah. flyers out to everyone. I, it's yeah. No, I totally agree with you. I think it does help you. But I do also think with the, the finance and the budget side, sometimes what str my struggle is with grants is they don't want to see you spending a lot of money in the product, like, just the managing or producing side. They obviously want to see you paying artists, which I think is very, very important. But they, the, the amount of time that if you say, oh, the producers, like, you know, take 10 or 15, this is what I found, 15 hours a week for three months, and that figure adds up to being way more than what artists are paid for, like, you know, I mean, our, our programs, artists do like a seven minute set. So our producer fee will always be higher than what artists are earning because the producer starts six months before, right? But yeah, that's my struggle with budgets mainly is the uh, um, grants, is the budget aspect. That is also why touching on what you said earlier, we always make sure the show makes sense without a grant to begin with, that our ticket sales are gonna cover what we're putting on. Our first year, we never got a grant. And we started, I know you, there's a question later about this, but we started really small, low expectations. So I think when you're first starting out, going really small and then building on that success and being like, right, what worked, what didn't? And then, and then you sort of learn and you build off of that. I don't think we would have scaled to the show that we we're doing now. So we're doing almost 30 across Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide and trying to sell almost around 2,500 tickets. We'll see how we go. But that's built a lot of like Melbourne success last year. And last year we invested, um, I, I'll be frank, last year was almost me voluntarily producing, I had a day job, but we invest a lot into marketing and then that's kind of paying off this year. So it is, a, you're playing the long game. The other thing is like, and we touch on this later, but burning out is a big one in this world. So it's like, play the long game, don't burn out. It's like, you gotta, uh, you know, I started this in my like mid twenties and I was, I was like, oh, we gotta get this done, this done, this done. And I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna be in it for the long game. So let's just pace myself and not fret and stress too much. And then there's always next year to start again. Yeah, absolutely. We might um, tease that out a bit more now. So you mentioned burnout. And I think the role of a producer can sometimes, um, as you say, be invisible or um, doesn't quite slightly get... Slightly thankless as yeah. well sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't quite get the accolades that perhaps it deserves. Um, well, y yes. And also, like, you do want the show and the artist to be the hero, yeah. of course. No one's going to pat you on the back for getting public liability insurance. <laughs> <laughs> I want a medal. I want to win a fringe medal for that. <laughs> So how we should do all get a badge. <laughs> how do you navigate that? How do you navigate that burnout when it's such a hustle as a producer? For me, it's that attitude of, which has finally shifted. Um, is that 
I'm in it for the long game. And if if something's really going to stress me out, then I'm like, it's okay, lower my expectations. I'm I think as producers, we all have very high expectations of our own self and our work. And that that is what causes our burnout more than anything, is the fact that we want a lot out of our work. We want it to sell out, we want it to go smoothly, we want it to win awards, we want it to get grants, and when it doesn't, when it falls short of any of those things, we feel like we're a failure. And I think that's a that I felt that in you know other brown women comedy's done well, but it's been like in other things I've done, I'm like, wow, that didn't go as I planned. But nobody put those expectations on me except me. <laughs> so I think it is an adjustment of your expectations, are still to be ambitious, but not to tie your sense of self worth to that. And that's an ongoing journey. Like I preach this like I know it, but every year it's like there is a little bit of where your self worth and your confidence and competence is is tied to how how your sales went or how well your show did. Yeah. Uh, I think you touched on it before about having a like life budget um, for things like food, yeah, like isn't that nice? I uh, love food. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and making sure that you eat and drink water and sleep and like I don't party like I used to during the fringe, like because I'm working. Yeah, so I think I've been to the fringe club once. Um, this the whole festival so far. It's more than me. <laughs> yeah, but I've never been to any of the three festivals we've done. I'm like, I'll go. I'll go yeah. get a drink and meet some new comedians. Never happens. Well, because that's there is often a pressure to go because of the networking aspect. Um, so yeah, you try to go to those things as much as possible, but also prioritize yourself and your sleep. And um, actually, if I don't have that late night and I get up early in the morning, maybe I can get on top of the emails and get some more press in or um, industry. Yeah, taking care of yourself first. And Britt, this year you're producing Fool's Paradise, your show, but you're also producing and managing the venue of Courtyard of Curiosities. Yeah. Um, is there, what are the differences between producing an event versus a venue? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, because I'm the programmer, um, and co-producer with Nick and he takes care of all the production side and I take care of the artists. So I, you know, I'm like an artist liaison as well. I like to communicate with my artists the same way that I like to be communicated to as an artist <laughs> and as a producer. Um, so I think that, yeah, my work as, as an indie um, producer has really helped with that. Um, a lot of the things are the same in terms of like making sure that I've got lists of like, okay, what do I need to do today? What emails do I need to send um, you know, as they're coming in? And obviously I'm getting a lot more because we've got 50 acts at the Courtyard of Curiosity. Uh, so, you know, when you're on top of your own marketing for your show, but then, you know, you've got questions coming through from, uh, yeah, you know, it's just like, oh, all the things that I need to do, I'm... I've already got that written down for myself. I'm going to communicate that information to you as well, just so you know that there is this marketing opportunity that's coming up. Or, um, so, yeah, it's transferring over, I think, because I'm not doing that production side so much. Um, yeah, it's, it's taking care of the artists. It's making your list a lot bigger, to, your to-do list a lot bigger, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. And you don't just have a responsibility to the show you're producing, you have a responsibility to all of the artists. And actually when I was running a venue, yeah. I would really feel that responsibility deeply. I would wake up, I would worry about making sure that the shows had everything that they need, the artists had everything that they need, that they felt like I was supporting them. And I just, that was a huge driver for me. And then at the end of the festival, I'd like just collapse for a week and just remember who I am. Um, and I think now as I get older and I'm a mum, that, that sort of all on needs to be more streamlined in a way. But also, it's the thing that you do when you're in your 30s to be able to just do it all and then work out the bits that you want to do afterwards. And, so. and yeah, no, on, touching on that, I think about in terms of like well being, I zoom out for the year. Like sometimes that I just accept that around this season, it's going to be really long hours. But then last year, straight after, I bought a spontaneous flight to New York, yeah. spent two months there, not working, just meeting people, having a great time. I was like, I'm taking a holiday. Um, and so I think it is like maybe day to day you might not have the routine during these festive 
kind of during the festival seasons. But as soon as it's over, then you're like, okay, what does it take to recoup and refresh? And so when you zoom out for a whole 12 months, like, did I take care of myself? Because sometimes I do feel, for me, it feels um, falls through the uh, cracks on a day-to-day basis during a really peak period. But then I, I recoup afterwards well and for a long time. I'd also like to say um, I'm feeling exactly what you had said about like that responsibility um, because yeah everyone comes to you and oh I don't have so many ticket sales today. Solve this problem. Solve this yeah. problem. It's my problem now. It's your problem. Yeah, you are, you are a professional problem solver, and actually that is in the copy of my show, <laughs> Fool's Paradise. <laughs> hey, come see Bri. I'm a professional problem solver. Um, uh, so uh, w- oh, what I wanted to say was. A a big thing that we've been creating at the Courtyard of Curiosities is community. And uh, as artists, like we, you know, we've got a Facebook group that we all, um, you know, if people need bums on seats if they need a table for their show, all of those kinds of things. But we all like hang around in the courtyard. We have conversations about each other's work. How can we support one another? And for me, that has just been the massive heart of this festival and this like pool of people that we brought together. And so, like, reaching out to those people that create similar work to you, oh, hey, you know, if it's another small independent artist, maybe, um, you know, you might see their show and love their show and they'll see yours and, oh, how about we pl- both plug each other after the show or um, on the Fringe website there's, like, this artist recommends, oh, I'll put your show at the bottom of my listing if you'll do the same for me and you can make those connections in that community and like I've met all these new artists this year as well that create similar work that are coming and um, yeah I think like that is the massive thing about Fringe is community yeah yeah that's something I've noticed coming to Adelaide um perhaps even more than Melbourne's a really really big city and maybe I didn't get enough time to tap into it but here the artist community is lovely like we've had other people we've never met say oh let us plug your show and then we'll plug their show and that's been really really nice it's like oh it's 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 because like we said it's a a lonely journey producing and so you're constantly like I'm slogging away I'm doing everything and you're like you know you throw a pity party I do um and then someone supports you you're like oh people people care (laughs) so it's it's, it's nice and there's people also going through the same thing you're going through so it feels it feels good when there's communities and to be able to talk about it because like you're constantly looking out for the well-being of artists but we're not I don't think we always do enough to look after our own well-being as like producers organizers people behind this work Gorgeous. Um, Daisy, you've worked in uh, Sydney Melbourne and now Adelaide I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, is it important? as a producer to be able to adapt to the different locations and is there a difference between each of the festivals? Yeah. And Our Sydney f- show first time will be uh, this year May but Melbourne we've done and we're doing Adelaide. It, it's been quite, I mean I speak from the perspective of it's a very, in terms of audience engagement, it's been very different. So Melbourne audience um, is like, our show was 80% ethnic and, and we had like 600 people. Adelaide is not like that as much. There's, there's there's not as many diverse people coming to our shows here, which is interesting. So it's a different audience entirely. And I think... Um, Adelaide as well, it's like when you're in a city like Melbourne, I think one thing I learned is like, like I said, statistically, there's like 200,000 South Asians. Our show is targeted brown women comedy. That's generally who comes to our show. There are other people, but generally that's who's been coming to our show. But Adelaide, it's been completely different. So I think I'm still learning a lot about how different cities. Getting into a city, what's always been helpful is uh, touching base with people you know or who they might know. Um, So in terms of Adelaide, I only knew a couple of people, but they put me in touch with others and we wouldn't have got the grant if it weren't for those collaborations. So I think whichever city you go to, getting in touch with locals and working out, like where do people hang out, where do people fly out, where do people, all of this is, is quite uh, important. And how do you go about navigating that, networking with other um, professionals and the finding the contacts that you need? Yeah, for me, I, I mean, I went on my LinkedIn and I looked up everyone. I've been quite active on LinkedIn. I used to be a content creator on kind of LinkedIn. So I looked up everyone I knew who lived in Adelaide and DM'd like 100 people. Uh, I was like, hey, I'm coming to Adelaide. I've got this show. Got any tips? And do you want a comp ticket? <laughs> so I, I just hit up everyone. I was like, let's just hand out comps. You get one, you get one just for the first sort of show and then ask them to bring friends and then give them it after the comp my strategy is to then set a discount 
discount code for your friends. So that's why we priced it kind of high because we want to do a lot of discounts for us. That's just a strategy. But networking, um, yeah, LinkedIn is really good. Honeypot, I mean, I've just set up like 15 meetings with that. We'll see how that goes. Um, that's that, that. I mean, I think if you're all producing shows here, then you'll have access to it. So that's you can talk a little bit more about that if you want. But yeah, LinkedIn, Honeypot, um, just I slide into a lot of DMs on Instagram. I have found 30 micro influencers in Adelaide now. <laughs> Most of them blog about food, though. <laughs> I was trying to find diverse influencers in Adelaide. It was a very small list. So I was like, let's just expand. <laughs> so Instagram, I just DM um, a lot of people. Like, hey, we got this show. Um, would you like to come along or would you like to promote it? Some people have been happy to promote it without, you know, just, just they're just really happy that something like this is coming to Adelaide. So social media, honeypot, yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit about how to network and in my experience the the best way to do it is softly and with a long-term goal with no hard deadlines. Um, I get it that some people are really excited about this show right now, got to happen and they can be like I've had some people come up to me at Honeypot <laughs> quite aggressively <laughs> and being like what can you offer me? Oh. I'm like oh no, that's no. not the way this works. <laughs> um, and I think that I've been able to work in different spaces and different countries because I've made friends. Um, and I'm not talking like bosom buddies forever and a day, although some of them have turned into bosom buddies. Um, but being nice to work with, um, being a human first and foremost, um, and being... and and. If you give people time, that's a hugely valuable thing. Um, and remembering that kindness is, is, I think, the way to way to catch flies, you know. Or well, honey is the way to catch flies. I think I just <laughs> butchered that. <laughs> I should be a writer. <laughs> um, so I think that actually when you're in these big networking places, you might have something to sell. But actually, it's also about putting the other person in that conversation first. So I, I said this the, the other day that if I get uh, an email which says, hi, this is my show. This is all about my show. This is about me. It would be good to chat. I don't know where I fit in that conversation. I don't know why you want to talk to me. But if someone said, hi, Joanne, I know that you're interested in international collaborations. I'm visiting Adelaide for the first time. I have a show that, by the looks of your producing history, I think this would be a great fit. I'd really love you to see it. If you can't see it, I've got video. Could we have a chat? I'm way more likely to engage in that because I know what they want from me and my place within it. And it's also not just like, here I am, notice me, it's great. It, the person has taken a step back and done a bit of a softer approach. And I think that that's really the way, long term, it works. So I've got had friends now for 15 years or whatever and I might have worked with them once or twice. But now when I see them at a honeypot thing, it's straight away, hugs, how's it going? And then I know that if there was a project that I could approach them with that would be a good fit for them as well as me, I have done all of that work. So it's long gaming isn't it? Producing no, I, I, is long game. Yeah, it? it's long game. And I think there's this, there's this saying in like the entrepreneurship world, which is when you work with founders who are looking for investment for their startup ideas. And it's like, if you want money, ask for advice. And if you want advice, ask for money, which is if you go to someone and say, we need X amount of investment in the founder world, they'll just stop giving you some advice. But the reason is if you're asking people for advice, you're looking for their input, their sort of thoughts. That's one way. Um, but yeah, I definitely the long game. And every time I reach out to people for sort of on Honeypot, for me, it's been, hey, uh, uh, you know, our show's on these days, but happy to get coffee or we can meet on Zoom. If you want some free tickets, let me know. Uh, and I only email people where I'm, I went through every profile. It was a long, it took a like 10 hours <laughs> I went through every profile and I chose people where I thought uh, we might want to go to that country and then I looked up I googled their theater and stuff I looked it up I don't think I got around to customizing each email because I had because we got it takes time yeah but, it does but also if you've got a lot of people to contact you yeah. can't quite do that yeah. but even one sentence yeah but it, we're really interested in yes. coming to that's yeah so I made sure I said we're really interested Pakistan, in coming to this country know. or, or yeah. this this thing uh, but also when you approach them in person it is a like you know I love like Adam Grant's philosophy on, there's a book he's written on give and take and it's you know he's got a great TED talk on it and it's just all about the more you give in life rather than take the further you will get as well uh, so it's not a zero-sum game yeah. how about yourself Britain 
I think that you, you've both said it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Covered it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Done. Absolutely. Efficient. <laughs> Networking is essential. Yeah. yeah. And it's an art. I'm, I mean, the only other thing I would add would be, you know, when you're out and about seeing shows um, yeah. and, you, yeah, artists that you whose work you like and if you're not a self-producing artist but a producer that's looking to pick up work, like connecting with that person after the show. Um, yeah. If there's – the soft approach is great. Um, but not too soft. Like, you know, sloppy drunk at 2 a.m. at the artist's bar. I don't know any deals that are done. <laughs> Actually, that's not quite true. Uh, there have been a couple of deals that have been done at 2 a.m. Uh, under the influence. Um, but generally, you want it to be, you know during waking hours, traditional waking hours. Uh, and if you send me an email at 1am, I will read it when I first wake up at 7 and then forget about it. So schedule things to come in during business hours, if at all possible. And e emails are good, I think, yeah, you know, if you are out and about and after a show you see that, programmer and you know you want to go have a chat and it's like hi I'm Britt Plummer I do the show called Fool's Paradise and it's about this 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 and it little like yeah yeah they just it's not gonna <laughs> probably go down um as well as oh you know I'm I'm Britt I, I know that you're um Sam from Summer Hall he's yeah. a great he's a great friend of mine um but um you know I'm doing this work I really love your venue I'm going to send you an email in the morning and then he'll go, oh, actually, I'm, I remember that person. I met them last night. Oh, this is all coming together. Now I've got a bit more information. But you've had to build up your um, confidence to be able to do that, right? Yeah, that yeah. That in itself is the art form, to be, to be brave, to approach Sam, to say, hi, you might not know who I am, but I know who you are. That's a bit weird. You know, like just to have those slightly awkward beginnings and then find the way to to iron out the social bonding, as it were. But I think it's also research, you know, like knowing, yeah. as you said, like knowing, oh, that venue I think is going to be perfect for my show. Yes. I've lived there every Edinburgh Fringe I've gone to and this is why my show is going to work well. Big plug for Summer Hall. Yeah. I love Summer Hall. <laughs> it's a beautiful venue. Great. You've um, talked about playing the long game. How do you sustain a long-term career in producing? Therapy? No, I'm joking. <laughs> oh, clowning. <laughs> um, I think little and often is the way that I've done it. Um, and actually dreaming quite big. Um, so, fun story. I had this vision that I was going to climb the Hollywood sign. And I did. And I didn't get arrested. <laughs> it was it was organised. But I thought that would be a pipe dream that I'd never actually be able to achieve. Little old me, Joe Hartstone from Adelaide, I can't go to Hollywood. I did it. And I did it by being brave and doing the thing that I do best and making connections and planning and, and taking a risk. And then having people who advocated for me as well and... Then eventually, yes, I did have a, a photo shoot up at the Hollywood sign, which was bucket list. Um, so I think you can dream as b bigger than you think you can. You really can do the things that you want to because you have to, but then understanding you have to eat an elephant one bite at a time. So if you have a really large goal, <laughs> if you have a really large goal, you can do that and that's absolutely possible but then your job is to take a step back and work out what those small steps are in order to get to, get to that. So that's why I think little and often is my best way um, rather than all at once, cram, cram, cram. My, my mother describes this lifestyle career as feast or famine. So it's either all on, all happening, all crazy, 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 nothing. And I love the nothing times and I love the feasting times. Um, I don't love the famine so much <laughs> in all of that, but that has been a little bit a part of it. But that's part of the, the juggle, I guess. So that's how now I'm 18, nearly 20 years into my career um, and I'm still here, I think, <laughs> somehow. But I think that's how I've been, just been doing it. Yeah, um, I would say managing your time in terms of uh, 
it's really easy to get on the fringe circuit and go, yeah, I'm going to do Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne. Um, what's after Melbourne? There's something. But I think then you go to Europe and then you go, <laughs> I'm going to do Brighton. Uh, there's a Scandi fringe circuit and then another one and then Edinburgh. And um, particularly, like, if you're a self-produced artist, you're on the stage and then you're, like, behind the scenes sending the emails and for the next festival and the next festival that and um burnout is massive um for people who you know do that um so sometimes it might be like oh okay maybe all my friends are doing those three back to back I want to do that as well oh actually why don't I put everything into like Perth is great to like premiere the work and then I'm going to put like a bit more money into Adelaide and then um, maybe I'll make some connections for Melbourne and I might do that the following year or I might make connections for Edinburgh this year um, you know by the end of Adam, Ed, uh, Adelaide Fringe I think a lot of the um, programming is already done there's a few spots but I don't necessarily need to jump on that train right now sometimes that might feel right um because yeah you have the time and energy to do that but I don't think um it's totally fine to go oh no actually I'm going to think about that for next year so that I have the time to apply for funding sleep eat take care of myself and then maybe I'll have a more successful season further on I think it's something that I've learned is that next year's fringe is going to happen (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Might not. <laughs> Isn't that a weird is thing? Is it? To Are say? we sure? It's real. It is going to happen, and a year is a year, but it's also a blink of an eye. And I've encouraged people not to rush into doing Edinburgh Fringe, for example, without really knowing and having the perfect season lined up. So, as an example. I was working in Edinburgh Fringe as a general manager of the company, as a publicist, um, producing shows. I didn't take my own show as a performer for eight years because I wanted to do it right. And then I wanted to have the right show, the right project, right venue, right publicist, right everything, a little bit of funding. Um, And then when I did go, I sold out. It opened doors. It was magic because I had let time give me the information I needed. And I really think there's something to be said about that, not rushing, even though it feels so immediate and so pressing and so now. And this is a very difficult thing to say when people are wanting to pay their bills and they're wanting to live. You know, there's a real different difficulty in playing the long game when everything feels so immediate. But actually, I think real success comes for those who plan. And next year is going to happen. So that would be my best advice. I also, I didn't do an Edinburgh Fringe until I'd been three years. And that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, like, yeah, I didn't go the first year without knowing anything about that yeah. festival. It is massive, yeah. We've got about five minutes left. We might um, wrap it up by, uh, if there was one piece of advice you could give yourself when you were starting as an emerging producer, what would that be? Just reminding uh, yourself of your why. Like, why did you get into this? It's something really simple, but it's sometimes we get caught up in the slog of all of the work that's involved that you sort of forget, why am I doing this? So, like, for us, it was, you know, representation, diversity. But even beyond that is, like, I never got to see women, brown comedians growing up from the, you know, from my background. But they also, we cast comedians that talk about things that often um, have a lot of stigma and shame that are taboo, like, you know, interreligious marriages and being bisexual and, you know, uh, ex- some comedians speak about their experience with bipolar, but a lot of things that I never got to hear about that has a lot of shame in our community. So anyway, I guess, I guess for us it was like, for me it's been what's the purpose of this show? It's to really platform these women who are going to talk about things that people aren't going to talk about and we're going to have a good time and laugh about it. Yeah, so let's remember your why. Yeah, it would be the same same for me, actually. Um, and I w- would also say don't let one person not liking your show or, like, one bad review, <laughs> like, kill a season, yeah? Um, because that 
is literally one person's experience of the, of the show on that one night, which may have been different to another night. But also, like, the art that we make might not necessarily be for everyone. And if it's more, like, challenging and particularly when you're younger and you're an emerging artist, you're like, oh, my God, two stars. I'm just giving up, I'm giving up completely. Um, but no, um, remember all those beautiful audiences that loved your work and came to you after the show and told you that and all the other things that people said and um, yeah, like lear I'm learning to dump and move on. <laughs> That's what my partner says. He's like, nah, and, and then you go. And like you take the bits that you need from reviews. So like that one might have a really great quote. You take that, you don't put the stars. Then the next one, you might put the stars and actually they didn't, there are no pull quotes. So um, you can tailor all of those things for your marketing to suit you. No, people aren't particularly going and looking up that particular publication and going to find that one review. Exactly right. Here, here. Um, my grandmother used to say, don't take the highs too high and don't take the lows too low. Uh, and I think that as a producer, you actually have to manage that for not just yourself, but actually your company as well, your artists, your venues, your audiences. Um, and if I, it, I would really love for, I mean, my grandmother said that to me when I was younger, so I should have learned it by now. Um, but when I was uh, starting off, the stress of launching into a festival was quite overwhelming for me. Um, and now, it's just another festival. And I think that uh, over the years, I've re remembered to keep that perspective in mind, that art is vital to life, but it's also not vital just to have that one show. So if something goes wrong, it's okay. We can just cancel the show for the night. You know, if so, more importantly, our people's health. You know, so if a performer is unwell, it's okay. It happens. We move on. We take a next step. There's a lot of stresses that we carry as producers. We carry everybody else's stresses and our own. And so, therefore, we need to be quite emotionally resilient. Um, and also, we get the knocks. We, we feel all of those slightly negative reviews and we feel elated with the, the great reviews and we feel elated with the awards, but actually the, the hard work still happens. So it would be, in part of playing that long game, is remembering just to go back to middle as much as you can. And, and that, yeah, it's, it's important to be resilient in this game. That was so therapeutic. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. My mother is a psychologist. Oh. <laughs> so. That was wonderful. So, I needed yeah, that too. <laughs> Gorgeous. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute delight hosting this today and tapping into your wisdom. So please join me in thanking Daisy Mann, Britt Plummer and Joanne Hearthstone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.